High above Athens, fighter jets track a 737 as it circles the city. 522, do you read? Over. There's no answer from the passenger plane, but there is someone at the controls. More than a hundred people are on board. Everybody's mind was going to a hijack or a terrorist. There is one person moving in the cockpit. Repeat, there is... What happened to the crew and passengers? 522, do you read? Over. And who is flying the plane? Helios 522, do you read? Over. Mayday, mayday. Early morning, August the 14th, 2005. The cabin crew of Helios Airways Flight 522 are preparing for their trip from the island of Cyprus to Athens, Greece. Sure is a beautiful day. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have come in. Andreas Prodromou is 25. He isn't supposed to be working today, but he's taken the flight to spend some time with his girlfriend, who also works for Helios. It's the sort of day I'd like to be out flying. Oh, you will, Andreas. Prodromu is a flight attendant now, but he has bigger plans. One day, he wants to fly for Helios. His dream was to become a professional pilot. Personally, I wanted him to stay in the family business. We often talked about this. We've got company. Okay. Stay warm at the back. I will. In the cockpit, the flight crew is occupied with the daily routine of preparing their jet for takeoff. Right today. Captain Hans Merton is an East German, a contract pilot hired by Helios for the busy holiday season. Are you almost through? Pardon? Are you almost done? Nearly. His co-pilot is from Cyprus. Pambos Charalambus has been working exclusively for Helios for the last five years. Before beginning any flight, crews are required to perform dozens of checks on various pieces of onboard equipment. It's a routine but necessary procedure. Doors closed. Sorry, could you start trays with your seat back? Helios is a charter airline with low-cost fares to Greece. It's a summer weekend and the plane is filled with families. In all, there are 115 passengers on the morning flight. If you need any more help, let me know we're just about to take off. They are low fare, no frills. Uh, they don't even serve you refreshments during small uh, uh, sorts of flights. Uh, but they offer another uh, uh, possibility for the budget-minded traveler. Paros Dimitriou and Maria Riku are traveling to the Greek island of Patros. They've just got engaged. Uh, they booked, uh, they booked uh, this uh, holiday a month or more than a month ago. It was like a honeymoon for them. Flight attendants, please take your seats. Prepare to take off. Just a few minutes after nine in the morning, Helios Airways Flight 522 lifts off into the bright sunshine. Nikos here, area control. This is Helios 522. Request cruising at 340. Helios 522, you are cleared to climb to 340. Have a good day. Set 340. 340.
Minutes into the flight, the plane is still climbing towards its cruising altitude. Suddenly, an alarm blares in the cockpit. What is it? The takeoff config warning? The flight crew is confused. The takeoff configuration alarm normally only sounds on the ground. It tells pilots their jet isn't ready for takeoff. The crew doesn't know why it's sounding now. Uncertain what the problem is, the captain radios the Helios Operations Center at Larnaca Airport back in Cyprus. Operations, this is flight 522, over. Flight 522, what can I do for you? We have a takeoff config warning on. Pardon? Our takeoff config warning is on. I'm sure it's nothing. I'll let you normally level off. With the first alarm still beeping in the cockpit, things become even more confusing. Their master caution alarm goes off. It could indicate that some systems on board are overheating. We now have a master caution. Engineer, 522, just a minute. I find him very hard to understand. His accent is quite thick. Flight 522, what can I do for you? The ventilation cooling fan lights are off. Sorry, can you repeat? While the pilots and ground engineers try to troubleshoot the two alarms, most passengers have no idea there's a problem until... Everyone, stay calm. But please remain seated. Everyone, please put the oxygen masks on completely over your mouth and nose. The protocol was immediately to secure yourself, grab an oxygen mask, stay in your seat. If you can help passengers without getting up, you could help them, and you should help them, but you would not risk the safety of any cabin crew member to go and help a passenger which is five or six rows further up. Their procedure would be to grab their mask, don it, and uh, wait for the aircraft to level off or commence with the descent. No one in the cabin knows what the problem is. They're waiting for information from the cockpit. The pilots are unaware that the oxygen masks in the cabin have dropped, and they still don't know why their takeoff configuration warning is on or why their systems are overheating. Both of my equipment cooling lights are off. This is normal. Can you please confirm your problem? But the engineer on the ground is struggling to get a clear picture of what's happening in the air. They are not switched off. Can you confirm that the pressurization panel is set to auto? Where are my equipment cooling circuit breakers? Behind the captain's seat. Can you see them? What's going on? There's something wrong with the electrics on 522. I had something to pick up from operations, so I was, I was there. I figured, oh, not again, one of our problems. So. I left. Oh, good luck. The problem doesn't seem serious. But as the plane continues to climb, passengers still haven't received any information from the cockpit. Helios 522, can you see the circuit breakers? And now the engineer on the ground loses contact with the aircraft. Helios 522, can you hear me? It's less than 30 minutes after takeoff, and Flight 522 is still on course. The plane is high above the Mediterranean Sea and headed straight towards Athens. August the 14th, 2005. A Helios Airways 737 with 121 people on board is circling in the sky near Athens. Helios 522, can you hear me? Shortly after leaving the island of Cyprus, two different alarms had been triggered on the plane. 
The flight crew was trying to solve the problem with the help of ground engineers. But now radio contact with the plane has been lost. Air traffic control can't get any response from the captain or co-pilot. The flight to Greece normally takes an hour and a half. But the passenger jet has been in the air for over two hours, circling in a holding pattern. We heard that uh, there was an airplane which was flying into the Greek territory and uh, had no, no communication. Everybody's mind was going to a hijack or to terrorists. More than three million people live in Athens. A plane slamming into the city could cause an incredible loss of life. This is a runaway aircraft. It's a possible hijacking or it's a possible uh, terrorist act. So let's involve the military. The Greek Air Force scrambles two of its most sophisticated fighter jets to investigate the Helios plane. Helios 522, do you read? Over. But the pilots aren't getting any response. One of the jets flies closer to the cockpit. Someone is in the co-pilot's seat, slumped over the controls. But there's no sign of the captain at all. The fighter pilot radios air traffic control in Athens. Athena ACC, there is one figure in the cockpit of Helios 522. It appears non-responsive. Athena ACC, checking the cabin. He can see passengers in their seats, but none of them reacts to the presence of the jet. Then the pilot sees someone moving in the cockpit. Athena Control, there is one person moving in the cockpit of Helios 522. Repeat, there is one person inside the cockpit. Helios 522, do you read? Over. Helios 522, over. Flight 8 cy 522, this is Athena Radar Control. The F-16s continue shadowing the jet but there's no response at all from the cockpit. One of them was actually in a shooting position behind uh, the 737. The other one was nearby the cockpit, and he was trying to communicate visually with the person in the cockpit. Suddenly, the 737 turns left and begins to quickly descend. After the ACC, Helios 522 turning sharply, following down. From more than 10,000 meters, the plane drops towards the ground. There is no structural failure. There is no fire. There is no problem, obvious problem, from the external view with the plane. Ilios 522, over. Do you read? Ilios 522, do you read? Over. Then, 2,100 meters above the ground, the person in the captain's seat acknowledges the fighter jet for the very first time but no words are exchanged. Neither the fighter pilot nor local air traffic control can make radio contact with the jet. Just after 12 o'clock, almost three hours after it took off from the island of Cyprus, Helios Flight 522 slams into the ground. Fire and rescue workers rush to the crash site. There are no survivors. Flight attendant Lazaros Temetsian is stunned by what he hears at the company's operations center. It was the most chaotic uh, scene I've ever seen. When I went back, our operations controller said that he lost the aircraft and, and his eyes, he's starting to cry. 
Helios is a small company with just three jets. Members of the cabin crew have been working together for years. For Paul Simeonides, news of the crash is particularly terrifying. He's a flight attendant for the airline, and so is his fiance. I think that must have been the worst 30 minutes of my life following that first image because Victoria was flying that morning to Glasgow. I had every one and his brother, every person we knew was calling me up to find out if I'm alive, if Victoria is alive, what happened, why it happened. At first we said it takes one hour and a half to go to Greece, so probably it's not that plain. And it took about two or three hours later to know that Paris and Maria was on the plane that crashed. Andreas Prodromu's father didn't know his son had been called to fill in on flight 522. I was told that uh, Helios aircraft was lost by radar and air controllers couldn't contact. I got worried. I called Andreas' phone. He always had it on. And unfortunately, he wouldn't answer. After that phone call, I felt as if the ground was pulled out from under my feet. It's the worst air crash in the history of Greece. Most of the 121 victims are from Cyprus. The small island nation declares three days of mourning following the crash. It's an eerie disaster. For over an hour, air traffic controllers watch the passenger jet fly in radio silence closer and closer to Athens, with no idea what was happening inside the jet. Now, piece by piece, investigators are trying to find out. So we climbed over the hill, and there we were, you know, facing this uh, situation, which was beyond any, any, any description. I saw a, a great area in front of me, which was burning. It was black. Burning, people spread, pieces of, of, uh, of the airplane. It is a truly nightmarish sight. I hope that I never experience it again. It was terrible, just terrible. Investigators immediately start looking for the cause of the crash. In the early days, their efforts take a frustrating turn. They recover the box containing the cockpit voice recorder, but the recorder itself has been thrown clear. It was difficult for us because we first, first found the case of the CVR very badly damaged, and uh, we could not find the, you know, the, the machine itself. Investigators need to know what happened to the pilots. Without the cockpit voice recorder, they have little to go on. So keep looking. Let's hope we can find it. Bodies recovered from the wreckage are brought to the offices of Athens' chief coroner. Autopsies add more mystery to the case. Everyone on board the plane was alive at the time of the crash. There were scenarios at the time that they had all died in midair. But the truth, they did not die from inhaling a toxic substance in the airplane or from an explosion. These people died on impact. But if the passengers were alive the entire flight, why didn't the pilot of the fighter jet see any activity inside the cabin? And who was at the controls as the jet circled over Athens? When investigators find tissue samples in the remains of the cockpit, they make a stunning discovery. The person at the controls of the plane when it crashed was flight attendant Andreas Prodromu, a last-minute addition to the cabin crew. 
But why was he in the cockpit? Was he trying to save the plane? Or did he deliberately fly it into the ground? Several days after finding the outer case of the cockpit voice recorder, investigators find the recording itself. When Chief Investigator Tsolakis listens to the final moments of the flight, it answers a vital question. Mayday. Mayday. This was no terrorist act. Flight 5, 2, 2. Prodromu was calling for help. Mayday. Solakis hears five separate maydays on the tape, even though none of them were heard by the air traffic controllers. From the first moment that they saw someone in the cockpit, believe me, I was certain it was Andreas. He wasn't a coward. He knew something about planes, and he had the capacity to do something. In fact, Prodromu had his commercial pilot's license. It was the first step towards his goal of becoming a captain for Helios. It's the sort of day I'd like to be out flying. Oh, you will, Andreas. But all of his training wouldn't have helped save the jet. When he was seen at the controls, Flight 522 had been in the air for almost three hours. And the reason the Helios plane seemed to veer away from the F-16s following it was because its left engine was out of fuel. No matter what caused the alarms to sound, the ultimate reason for the crash was simple. The DFDR and the CVR gave us absolute proof that the plane ran out of fuel. And this was with the cause of the crash. Scheduled as a 90-minute flight, the plane didn't have enough fuel to stay in the air for over three hours. But why had the plane flown so much longer than it was supposed to? Solakis now knows who was in the cockpit of the plane and why it crashed. But to fully understand the mystery, he needs more information. His investigators uncover a suspicious history of maintenance issues with the Helios jet, issues that could help explain what happened on Flight 522. Less than a year before the crash, the same aircraft had suffered a rapid decompression. Lazarus Temetsian worked on that flight. I was in the back of the aircraft at the time. There was a loud metallic bang, a clanging sound, uh, and the uh, oxygen masks dropped in the cabin. <coughs> Every step I was taking was difficult. It was hard to move, uh, hard to breathe. In fact, I was, I, I was starting to pant. I was panting for air. As the plane began an immediate descent to 3,300 meters, all Temetsian could do was remain strapped in and wait. Once the plane reached a safe altitude, Temetsian inspected the rear door and was shocked by what he found. I noticed that the aft service door was not fully locked. The hinges on the top and the bottom of the door were kind of displaced. I could pass my hand right through. There were no injuries, and the plane made an emergency landing, and the door was inspected. But this wasn't the only problem crews had with this plane. We would record faults in the cabin logbook constantly, and nothing would be done to rectify even these small little problems in the cabin. Engineers would take months to rectify even the slightest problem in the cabin. There were more recent problems as well. A Helios ground engineer tells Solakis that on the very day of Flight 522, the 737 had another problem with its back door. When we checked the flight log for the trip, we saw that we'd have to do some unscheduled maintenance. The plane had arrived in Cyprus just after midnight on August the 14th. 
The cabin crew had heard loud banging noises and saw ice on the rear service door during the flight. It was scheduled to take off again just hours later. Soon after it landed, engineers began checking the problem. To make sure there's nothing wrong with the seal on the door, the engineers run a pressurization test. During normal flight, a plane's engines force air into the cabin. To ensure oxygen circulates during the trip, small valves in the rear allow some of it to leak out. The pressurized airplane essentially is sort of like a uh, pressurized can. When we pressurize the airplane so that the people inside can survive the environment that the airplane likes to operate in. Switching digital pressure control unit from auto to manual. Without the jet's engines running, the engineer uses the plane's auxiliary power unit to force air into the aircraft, and the cabin is pressurized for several minutes. It's like looking for a leak in a tire. In this case, what you're having to do is pressurize the aircraft, use a, bar a barometer, essentially, to monitor the pressure inside, uh, and look for leaks that way. But there's no indication any air is escaping through the back door. Uh, in this case, they felt that it was all right, and they uh, completed the test. The entire jet seems to be in good working order. After performing a series of additional routine maintenance procedures, the engineers signed off on their technical log. Investigators are faced with a dead end. An explosive decompression could have explained the tragic events of Flight 522. If the oxygen had been suddenly sucked out of the jet, everyone on board could have been overcome. But not only did engineers check the problem, when the F-16s approached the plane near Athens, no damage was seen. There was no indication that the fuselage was punctured. Investigators are still struggling to solve the mystery. What had overcome the passengers and crew of Helios Flight 522? And why was one flight attendant apparently unaffected? The discovery of one small switch holds the key to the entire crash. The crash of Helios Flight 522 is one of the most mysterious air disasters ever. Helios 522, do you read over? All investigators know for sure is that shortly after takeoff, the crew stopped communicating with air traffic controllers. Helios 522, over. Then, after two and a half hours in the air, one of the plane's flight attendants was seen at the controls. Eventually, the plane ran out of fuel and crashed, killing 121 people. But investigators are stumped. They still don't know what had happened to the plane's captain or the rest of the crew. Tell me about what happened the day of the flight. They concentrate on the conversation between the pilot and the Helios engineer shortly after takeoff. As the plane passed through 3,700 meters, an alarm sounded in the cockpit. Operations, this is flight 522, over. Flight 522, what can I do for you? We have a takeoff config warning on. Pardon? Our takeoff config warning is on. Usually, the takeoff config warning is only triggered on the runway. But wreckage recovered at the crash site reveals no problems with the plane's flaps, landing gear, or anything else that could trigger the alarm. So why had it sounded? Chief Investigator Akrivos Solakis focuses on a small control panel found in the wreckage of the ravaged jet. Are you sure this is the way it was found? It hasn't been moved at all. We were lucky finding this panel, which had the switch on the manual position, was a major one. The P5 pressurization panel ensures that passengers have enough air to breathe, even at high altitudes. Normally, pressurization takes place automatically. As the jet climbs, its engines force air into the plane as they power it through the sky. 
But when the pressurization switch is set to manual, both the captain and co-pilot are responsible for maintaining the cabin atmosphere using a controller. So explain again how you tested the pressure. When I went into the cockpit, I turned the pressurization switch to manual. Solakis learns that during the early morning maintenance check on Helios 522, ground engineers had turned the P5 switch to manual. That allowed them to use the onboard generators to test the pressure seals on the plane's rear door without starting the engines. When the test was over, they didn't turn the switch back to automatic. The procedure of pressurizing the aircraft has to do with setting the pressurization system from uh, auto to manual. They were supposed to return uh, the uh, selector to the auto position. Several hours later, when the flight crew entered the cockpit, the pressurization switch was still set to manual. Lead air switches. It's bright today. Are you almost through? Pardon? But neither the pilot nor co-pilot saw it. As a result, after takeoff, the cabin would not pressurize automatically. And the higher Flight 522 climbed, the thinner the atmosphere became. Not turning the switch back to automatic was a deadly hidden danger. Are you sure this is the way it was found? It hasn't been moved at all. Solakis believes this panel could be the key to the disaster. Leaving one switch on manual could have led to all the other problems the plane faced. To prove he's right, he takes an unusual step. Four months after the disaster, he takes an Olympic Airlines 737 on the same route flown by the Helios jet. If he's right about what caused the crash, this plane should react exactly like the doomed airliner did. Are we ready to go? When there is a complicated accident like this, I think a reenactment re should, should be performed. Of course, it's expensive to have uh, a jetliner flying for three or four hours. Uh, but it is worthy if you, uh, you have to come uh, with some results which uh, benefit to the overall investigation. Make sure the P5 is set to manual. Uh, it's hard to see. In the cockpit, Solakis has the crew turn the pressurization switch to manual. A green light indicates it's no longer on automatic. But in the bright glare of an early morning departure, the light is hard to see. As the reenactment flight climbs, oxygen is thinning quickly in the aircraft. The same thing happened on the Helios flight, triggering an alarm. But is it? The takeoff config warning? The alarm sounded and that alarm was misinterpreted. Most of flight crew, they will never face uh, an alarm with no pressurization in all their uh, flight career because it's a rare event. So Lakis confirms that the alarm went off because of the dangerously low air pressure in the aircraft. But he also discovers that the sound itself is identical to the takeoff config warning. We have a takeoff config warning on. But even if the flight crew did misinterpret the first alarm, they still had another chance to determine what the real problem was. At almost 5,000 meters, the plane's master caution light flashed on and stayed on for almost a minute. We now have a master caution. But once again, the pilots misinterpreted the cause of the alarm. The master caution light can indicate that the plane's systems are overheating but it can also tell pilots the oxygen masks are down. In this case, it was doing both at the same time. But since the crew didn't think they were having pressurization problems, they focused on the plane's cooling systems. The alarm about uh, the non-cooling was a side effect of non-pressurization. Actually, it was not 
really that uh, there was a high temperature inside the, uh, uh, the avionics bay, but it was the sensors that they were supposed to measure the temperature and the pressure in that area sensed that something was wrong. On the recreation flight, investigators monitor instruments recording the same events occurring on board their aircraft. At the same time, they also begin to feel the effects of the lack of oxygen. The first feelings you'd start to have were your, your ears would pop and you'd start feeling pressure in your sinuses. Uh, as you climb higher, you begin to feel almost giddy. It's almost like having a couple of drinks of alcohol. The dwindling oxygen levels could also help explain some of the crew's bizarre behavior. When the ground engineer asked about pressurization... Can you confirm that the pressurization panel is set to auto? Captain Merton ignores the question and responds with one of his own. Where are my equipment cooling circuit breakers? You really don't notice it at first. It, it, it's amazing how subtle it can be in the early phases. They'd start feeling dizzy. Um, they begin to lose the ability to think coherently. Uh, in a way, it, it, it traps you uh, into the situation. Uh, you can't react to anything. Uh, eventually, you're going to lose consciousness. Solakis believes that the captain may have been checking on the circuit breakers behind his seat when he and the co-pilot finally ran out of air. And unlike in the cabin, the oxygen masks in the cockpit do not automatically deploy if the atmosphere begins to thin. Can you hear me? On the other side of the locked cockpit door, no one in the cabin would have known that the plane was now flying itself. Nor would they have realized that a limitation of the passenger oxygen system had sealed the fate of everyone in the cabin. Passenger masks are supplied by a chemical generator above their seats. But the generators only produce enough oxygen to last about 12 minutes. Well, the problem with the passenger masks is, for one thing, they're not designed to keep you oxygenated at, at a high altitude. What they're designed to do is give you enough oxygen so that you can survive until you can, the pilots get the airplane down to a low altitude. In almost every event where we've had a decompression, that's been perfectly adequate. For those who did put their masks on, they would have remained conscious for several minutes until their oxygen ran out. Then they too would have passed out. Once you get up to 34,000 feet, you're talking useful consciousness of 30 to 60 seconds. Most of the people, once the hypoxia begins to cause them to lose consciousness, they're just going to go to sleep. Without a flight crew, Helios 522 would have continued to Athens on autopilot. When the crew didn't take control, the autopilot would have put the jet in a holding pattern as it flew over the airport. Exactly the same thing will happen on the reconstruction flight if cabin pressure isn't restored. So Lakis asks the co-pilot to reset the P5 panel to auto before the jet continues to climb to its cruising altitude of just over 10,000 meters. Then, as it approaches Athens, Solakis also has an F-16 shadow the jet, performing the recreation. He wants to confirm that it was Andreas Prodromu at the controls of Flight 522 when it went down. We dressed one of our guys with the uniform of the steward. He came in, he sat on the, on the captain's chair, and the F-16 was looking at him. He was confirming that it was exactly what he saw on the accident plane. The reconstruction also answers another question about the tragic fate of Helios Flight 522. The cockpit voice recorder picked up several strange noises. They're heard just before Prodromu enters the cockpit. Solakis confirms that these sounds were made by Prodromu using the electronic keypad to unlock the cockpit door. We confirmed all those items and, and uh, during the enactment flight, uh, flight, and it was very, very 
uh, useful. It filled a lot of gaps we had. Okay, take it down. For Chief Investigator Tsoulakis, the reenactment flight has been convincing. There was no dramatic cabin failure. Instead, a series of small mistakes and misunderstandings had led to the worst air disaster in Greek history. Fifteen months after the crash, Greek authorities released the official report on Helios Airways Flight 522. But mysteries remain. What was happening in the cabin while the doomed airplane flew towards Athens? And why was Andreas Prodromou the only one conscious at the very end? The crash of Helios Flight 522 was the worst disaster in the history of Greek aviation. Like many crashes, it was a fatal combination of mechanical problems and human error. The final accident report details a tragic series of oversights and false assumptions made by the flight crew. Problems that could have been easily prevented turned deadly for all 121 people on board. Where are my equipment cooling circuit breakers? Behind the captain's seat. Can you see them? But what the final report does not do is explain what happened in the cabin of the plane. What actions did the flight attendants take? And why was Andreas Prodromu still conscious after almost three hours? Maybe. Maybe. Interviews with Helios safety instructors and crew members paint a tragic picture of what may have occurred. Everyone, please put your mask on. We're not sure what the trouble is but remain calm and please remain seated. Prodromu was sitting at the back of the cabin. When the oxygen masks fell, he would have waited for instructions from the cockpit. The flight attendants sitting at the front of the plane would have done the same, but none of them would have waited forever. We made it an issue at Ilios to, uh, to emphasize that cabin crew should not entirely depend on their procedures, but to think on their feet and to adapt to any impending situation. In most depressurizations, the plane descends quickly. But as minutes passed on the Helios flight, the plane continued to climb. Unsure of what was going on, Prodromu would have tried to contact the flight crew. Captain. Captain Merten. But he gets no response. Can you give us an update, please? Captain Merten. With no word from the cockpit, he would have soon realized that this was not a typical depressurization. When there was no call out from the cockpit and the aircraft didn't start an emergency descent, there was absolutely no protocol. It would be, they would be winging it. By now, Prodromu must have felt that something was terribly wrong. But to find out what the problem was, he had to leave his seat. The oxygen available on the 737 is of course the dropout oxygen. 10% of those masks are available for the crew in case of a depressurization incident. There are extra masks per every seat row. Taking advantage of the extra passenger masks, he could have made his way to the front of the plane, a process cabin crew called monkey swinging. But if more than 12 minutes had passed, his girlfriend and the other flight attendant may have still been in their seats and like the passengers, overcome by hypoxia. But Prodromu was a scuba diver and a former soldier in the Cypriot Special Forces. His training may have helped him to stay alert a little longer. Andreas was not a coward. He was a brave person, fearless, brave and very calm. But to survive after the passenger oxygen system stopped working, he needed another solution. The 737 had four portable oxygen bottles. Each one could last more than an hour. All four bottles were found at the crash site. Three of them appeared to have been used. 
While the F-16 pilot saw Prodromo in the cockpit just before the crash, it may not have been the first time he had gone in. As he did at the end of the flight, he could have used the security code to unlock the door earlier. The procedure would be to enter the flight deck via the cockpit door, initially to bang on the door, and then if no uh, response is forthcoming, to enter the code and enter the flight deck. During the accident investigation, DNA was discovered on an oxygen mask in the cockpit that matched the co-pilots. It's possible Prodromu used it to try and revive him. You can still revitalize somebody for quite an extended period of time if you get to them before major brain damage is set in. And that, that's somewhat a variable uh, situation depending on the person, uh, depending on how long they're exposed to a, a high altitude. But if he was in the cockpit earlier, why did he leave? No one will ever know. Probably was a little bit disoriented, a little bit confused. He's reacting a lot slower than he normally would. What was his state of mind? What was his physical condition? We think that uh, he knew what, what was really the problem, but is that the real uh, situation? It's a real question. After three hours in the air, everyone who didn't have bottled oxygen would have been unconscious. As it approached Athens, Flight 522 was now a ghost plane. Most of the victims, uh, they probably still had heartbeats when the airplane crashed, but almost certainly were in an irre irreversible coma. Hypoxia is no more painful than falling asleep. But for Andreas Prodromu, the flight must have been a nightmare. As the F-16s roared to meet the jet, and with his oxygen running out, he must have known that he too was almost out of time. Yet to the very end, he didn't give up. Prodromu made one last attempt to save the plane. When he returns to the cockpit, the young flight attendant who dreamed of becoming a pilot calls for help. But no one can hear him, probably because the radio was still tuned to Larnaca, the airport on Cyprus where the flight had taken off. Fighting hypoxia and struggling to control an airplane larger than any he had ever flown, Prodromu was in an impossible situation. Even if he could have landed the plane, it was now too late. Flight 522 was out of time and fuel. There are pictures of Andreas in Cyprus, in the cemetery where he and his girlfriend Charis are buried side by side. As his father, my son is in front of me. Wherever I go, he is always there. He left a very big gap. We will never get over it. There are pictures in Greece, too. On the hill north of Athens, where Helios Flight 522 crashed, there are faded photographs of many of those who died. Bleached by the brilliant Mediterranean sun, they gaze over the rugged, ancient terrain, silent witnesses to one of the world's most bizarre and tragic airline disasters.
It's been over a year since a plane crash claimed the life of Polish President Lech Kaczynski. How could it have happened that the plane crashed and didn't reach the airport? Worse, the president's plane crashed on Russian soil. This was a chief of state of a neighboring country, an extremely sensitive political mission. Russian experts have conducted an investigation and reported their findings. The Polish pilots are at fault. It seemed there was some kind of dirty trick here. Conspiracy theory sprung up immediately. Polish Interior Minister Jerzy Miller has examined the evidence and has come to a different conclusion. Everyone understood the importance of this investigation. The stakes go far beyond aviation safety. The pride of a nation and even its political future may hang in the balance. It's not every day that they have to investigate a plane crash and it's a matter of top political importance. Jerzy Miller is just hours away from revealing the conclusions of Poland's independent investigation into the devastating crash at Smolensk airport. It all started 15 months earlier. Polish Air Force Flight 101 is carrying 89 passengers, including President Lech Kaczynski. Four of Poland's best pilots are in the cockpit, their elite military airmen from the country's special aviation regiment. Have you decided yet? Throttle down. Throttle down. Just after 10 o'clock, the plane begins its descent to Smolensk. The state flight from Warsaw took off at 9.27 this morning. The passengers are a cross-section of the Polish elite, dignitaries on their way to mark a grim and controversial anniversary. This anniversary was on April the 10th. It was a great Polish tragedy, the murder of Polish soldiers in World War II by Stalin. In 1940, Stalinist forces marched 22,000 Polish officers and intellectuals into Russia's Katyn forest to be executed. The Soviet government took the decision, the document still exists, to murder them all. For decades after World War II, the Soviet Union held Poland firmly in its grip. Until the fall of communism, the Soviets denied all responsibility for the Katyn massacre. The history of Polish-Russian relations has been very difficult, especially when it comes to the Soviet period, because no one wanted to have blood on their hands for shooting the Polish officers. For the first time, the Russian government was acknowledging the crime committed and the pain that the Poles still feel for that crime. No one better understands Poland's troubled past than President Kaczynski. He's a highly respected statesman with political roots in the anti-communist solidarity movement of the 1980s. Kaczynski cared extremely deeply about Polish national tradition wanted to be there to commemorate the dead on the anniversary of the massacre. By visiting a memorial near the site of the massacre, the Polish president is taking an important step towards reconciliation. Of course, there was a lot of media attention for this event. We started preparing and making arrangements around two weeks ahead of time. The man who has organized this momentous occasion is Director of Protocol Mariusz Kazana.
Water for you, sir. President Kaczynski and his wife, ma'am, are joined by many of Poland's top brass, including Lieutenant General Andrzej Błaszczyk, commander of the Polish Air Force. There are also descendants of the victims of the massacre traveling to today's ceremony. To the extent that I can attempt to imagine their mood, it would have been solemn and powerful and sad. The elite crew is flying a Tupolev Tu-154M, an extremely popular Russian-built plane. As they get closer to the airport, the workload picks up. Flight engineer Andrzej Michalak must calculate engine performance. May I please have the temperature and pressure? Yeah, I'll tell you what the temperature is. Cold. <laughs> he needs some vital information from the tower. Are we going to speak Russian? Yes. English is the international language of civil aviation. But since Smolensk is a military airport, controllers here speak only Russian. Passenger jets don't normally land at this base. But for the Polish delegation, it's the closest runway to the Katyn Memorial. This was a military airfield, and the incoming flight was, as a matter of fact, civilian. It doesn't matter that the crew was made up of members of a special division of the Polish military. The plane was flying according to the rules of civilian aviation. Captain Arkadiusz Protasiuk is the only member of this crew that speaks Russian. He'll have to handle the communication with the tower. Polish 101. Polish 101. Good morning. Polish 101 acknowledge. Polish Air Force, we have fog. Visibility is 400 meters. Understood. Polish Air Force 101. Heavy fog, visibility is only 400 meters. The fog was so dense, nothing was visible. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face or the person standing next to you. Smolensk Air Base doesn't have the equipment needed for a radio-guided landing. It is not the best technologically equipped airfield in our country. The pilots will first have to descend to 100 meters, then look for the runway. Once they spot it, they will have to land manually. Temperature and pressure, please. Temperature is plus two, pressure is seven, four, five. We do not have landing conditions. Continuing our approach, if we're unable to land, we'll go around on autopilot. Captain Protasiuk takes his plane lower to get a first-hand look at landing conditions. From their flying experience, the crew knew that fog can be uneven. One minute, it can be very dense, but 10 or 15 minutes later, the wind can clear it. But as they get closer, the fog gets even thicker. Approaching outer marker, on course and on glide slope. Then the situation takes a turn for the worse. As the crew strains to catch sight of the runway, the sound of an alarm suddenly fills the cockpit. 100 meters. Terrain, terrain. Pull we are leaving up. for a go around. In the cabin, passengers are preparing for an imminent landing. Terrain, terrain. Pull up. up. 90 meters. But the crew is struggling to make the plane climb. Terrain, terrain. Pull up. Terrain, terrain, pull up. 40. Terrain, terrain, pull up. Terrain, terrain, 30. pull up. 20. Depart for the go around.
How long has it been? One of the darkest days in Polish history. A day that was to have been commemorated by the president himself will now be remembered for yet another tragedy. At the Katyn Memorial, hundreds of people await the arrival of the Polish delegation. But what they get instead is devastating news. The president's plane has crashed. No one could imagine that something like this tragedy, this crash, could happen. When we heard the first rumors that the Polish plane had crashed, we thought it was a foolish joke. But then, after about 10 minutes, we saw how the Polish people were hugging and crying. There was a witness who used a cell phone to record the very first seconds of the tragedy, when you could still see the fire, when the fuel was still burning. Minutes after the crash, military personnel and rescuers converge on a forest 420 meters short of the runway. They discover a scene of total destruction. The charred remnants of the president's plane litter the ground. When I got to the crash site, my first impression was, when did they remove all the bodies? But after I got a closer look, the picture was very sad. There were body fragments, 96 people, and not a single full body. I couldn't even imagine this was possible. No one has survived. It's a monumental tragedy. The only thing I could see that had survived was the wreath they were bringing to the Katyn Memorial. With questions already swirling about how such a disaster could happen, Russian air accident investigators arrive at the crash site. We only need a gamma post. See what we have to work with. They are members of the Interstate Aviation Committee known as the MAK. Let's start over there. Their task will be to figure out what happened and why. We need to map every quadrant. It's not every day that they have to investigate a plane crash, and it's a matter of top political importance. News of the Polish president's death on Russian soil stuns all of Poland. I thought about the people on board the plane. Because, you see, I knew most of the passengers personally. As the nation grieves, shock and sadness soon become mixed with suspicion. My first thought was, was it an attack? Because of the deeply hostile relationship between Poland and Russia, conspiracy theories sprung up immediately. Many Poles are convinced the world has just witnessed an assassination, a targeted killing orchestrated by President Kaczynski's political adversaries. These were accusations that not only um, the crash was an intentional attack by the Russians, but that the Polish government knew it and was actually in cahoots with the Russians in order to eliminate a dangerous political opponent. With so many high-ranking officials now dead, some fear Poland's entire government may collapse. I was terribly concerned that um, we might not make it, that these were the 100 out of the 400 most important people in Poland. I wasn't sure if um, we've produced a state that can weather this shock. At the crash site, the evidence is pointing in a direction that will not sit well with Poles. Why would they even try to land in this rock? 
Some claim the Polish pilots should not have tried to land in the heavy fog. The suggestion raises anger in Poland. For the partisans of the conspiracy theory, it was just another Russian whitewash. Poland's leaders are desperate to uncover the truth about the crash. They send their own investigators to work alongside the Russians. It was a big challenge. Altogether, there were 34 people fully engaged in conducting research on this crash. What have you got so far? We approached the investigation with sound procedures, meaning that in the beginning, we assumed that every potential cause was possible, and then we gradually eliminated what didn't fit. They launch a painstaking search for any evidence that the flight may have been brought down by assassins. We also checked to see if there was any trace of explosives on the airplane wreckage. Careful analysis by both Russian and Polish experts reveals no explosive residue on the wreckage. No sign that the plane was shot down. Investigators on both sides agree. The crash is a tragic accident, not a political assassination. That possibility was ruled out very quickly because of the complete lack of evidence. Investigators must find the plane's black boxes. Excuse me, any sign of the flight recorders? Not yet, but it's out of priority. You know, of course, we need all three. Of course. With suspicion growing at home, Polish investigators anxiously want to get their hands on all of the plane's recorders. The Tupolev had three. The cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder are Russian-made. Have you decided yet? They will reveal what the pilot said and how the airplane performed. A third Polish-made device called the Quick Access Recorder also captures flight data, but it can only be read by the device's Polish manufacturer. If the Russian and Polish data match, investigators will be assured that no one has tampered with either machine. It was essential because we expected to hear suspicions or accusations from the public that the data read by the MAK experts had been tampered with. While the search for the recorders continues, investigators seek answers from the air traffic controller on duty that morning. They want to know why the pilots tried to land in such heavy fog. They were not coming in to land. They were only doing a trial approach. They learned that the crew was warned about the poor visibility. We do not have landing conditions but they wanted to judge conditions for themselves. Polish, one, zero, one. From 100 meters, be prepared to do a go around. The plan was to descend to 100 meters and then fly over the airport. Um, 100 meters, that was the decision height. Approaching below the minimum always brings the risk of hitting objects on the ground. After that, there's no certainty that attempting a go-around can be done safely. But investigators are puzzled. Something doesn't add up. At an altitude of 100 meters, the plane should have easily cleared the trees. Surveying the forest, they work to identify the first tree that Tupolev slammed into. They find it slightly more than a kilometer from the runway. Pilots hit the tree at 11 meters. If they intended to fly at 100 meters, how did they hit the tree? We need more information. 
For some reason, the presidential jet was flying dangerously low as it sped towards the airport. Was it a failure of the Russian plane or a mistake by the Polish crew? Investigators move one step closer to finding some answers with a major breakthrough, the recovery of the two Russian-made black boxes. The Polish flight recorder, though, remains buried in the wreckage. Any sign of the QAR? Not yet. The flight data recorder may hold valuable clues about what doomed the president's plane. The device is rushed to the MAK laboratory in Moscow. Investigators download the data, searching for any sign of an onboard mechanical failure. But the analysis comes up empty. Looks like everything was functioning. Until the moment the plane struck the first tree, there was no malfunction whatsoever. We'll send you a copy of the data. It's beginning to look like the initial speculation is true. The Polish pilots may be at fault. Polish investigators need to be sure the Russian data has not been tampered with. Their only hope is to find the missing Polish-made flight recorder. But so far, the search is proving fruitless. Only by combining all the parameters could we answer the questions. Did the crew follow procedures? Was the plane working properly to the end? Meanwhile, investigators from both countries turn their attention to the cockpit voice recorder. This is a very important element that helps accident investigators understand the crew's last moments in the plane. Let's go ahead. They immediately notice something unusual. That sounds like the captain. The captain is the one making radio calls to air traffic control, and he's doing it in Russian. Why is the captain making the radio calls? Proper aviation procedures call for the navigator to handle the radio, while the captain concentrates on flying the plane. Investigators suspect the captain decided to handle the radio himself because he was the only one who could speak Russian. The captain who was flying the plane was in charge of the crew and handling the radio communication. His workload was too heavy. Moments later, the recording reveals something even more surprising. Mr. Director, Fogg has rolled in and the conditions we have right now will not be able to land. Who is he talking to? Mr. Director, the fog has rolled in. In the conditions we have right now, we will not be able to land. We'll make an attempt, but it probably won't work. Then, we have a problem. Sounds like Kazana, the director of protocol. What he's doing in the cockpit? The pilots were not alone in the cockpit. We could hear voices of people who were definitely not crew members, and this meant that the cockpit was accessible to people who were not part of the flight crew. From 100 meters, be prepared to do a go around. Acknowledged. Safety rules forbid visitors in the cockpit at key points in the flight. It was surprising because it confirmed that the cockpit wasn't sterile. There's a rule that below a certain altitude, pilots should be isolated from the rest of the plane so they can concentrate on their tasks. It now appears the presence of so many top officials on board affected the decision to land. Sir. I have some news from the cockpit. 
We describe it as indirect pressure, the pressure resulting from the weight of the task and the mission the air crew was completing. Some investigators believe General Boisig also visited the cockpit. As the mystery behind the crash of Air Force 101 grows deeper, one thing is clear. In a crash, be it an air crash or a political crash or a crash in human relations, very seldom there's just one factor. There is much more to this tragedy than simple pilot error. While Poland mourns the loss of its president, suspicion and doubt still linger over the cause of his death. Conspiracy theories are spreading. The Polish media distrusted the information provided by the Russian experts. It seemed there was some kind of dirty trick here. But at the crash site, investigators have uncovered the one thing that could erase many of those suspicions the Polish-made flight recorder. Finally, Polish experts can study the data from both flight recorders side by side. They look for any discrepancy, any hint that the black box data has been altered. After a careful analysis, they reach a definitive conclusion. All the data's here. The two sets of data are a perfect match. It was important for us because it removed all doubt that the data might have been manipulated. With the data verified, investigators refocus their attention on the cockpit voice recorder. Turn on your landing lights. Lights on. They hear a warning that the plane is dangerously low. But strangely, the pilots don't seem to react to it. You can't see a thing. Why aren't they concerned about their altitude? They should be. The reactions of the pilots and the crew should be immediate, without any hesitation. When we listened to the recordings for the first time and heard the very clear system warnings, it was very surprising that the crew didn't react properly. Turn on your landing lights. Investigators are puzzled by the crew's behavior. They compare the plane's intended flight path to the altitudes called out by the navigator. 100 meters. 90 meters. 40. 30. 20. Stop. 40. Just after the navigator calls out 20 meters, 20. the unmistakable sound Stop. of the plane hitting the first tree. 20 meters? They hit the tree at 11 meters, not 20. Something's not right. The navigator is calling out 20 meters, but the plane is only 11 meters from the ground. They didn't know the altitude. The recording leaves investigators with two important questions. Why did the crew ignore the alarms? And why were they closer to the ground than they thought? They pore over the flight data, checking for signs of an altimeter malfunction. Lieutenant. It could explain the crash. What happens here? But instead of a malfunction, they find that the altimeter reading makes a sudden jump. A barometric altimeter shows the plane's height above sea level by measuring atmospheric pressure. Air pressure goes up as the plane goes down. When approaching an airport, pilots usually calibrate the altimeter to account for the airport's height above sea level. But that's not what this crew did. Someone reset the altimeter. One of the crew members switched the captain's altimeter to a pressure which changed the altitude reference. The plane seemed a little bit higher than it was in reality. 
The numbers show that the instrument was reset to its default setting, a move that resulted in an altimeter reading much higher than the plane's actual height above the ground. Why would a pilot do that? Polish investigators take their questions to pilots from the same special regiment that flew the president. What do you think they were doing? They learn that military pilots sometimes use the barometric altimeter to solve an annoying problem. The altimeter is connected to the terrain altitude warning system, or TORS. It alerts pilots if they're getting too close to the ground. The system is pre-programmed with the location of most major airports and will not sound an alarm when the pilots are coming in to land. But that only works if the airport is in the database. Many, including Smolensk, are not. The Smolensk airport, which is a military airport, was not included in the TAWS system. The alarm goes off so frequently at military airports that some pilots have developed a dangerous habit of disregarding the sound. You can't see a thing. We analyzed many flights, and it turns out that they were in the habit of ignoring these alarms. And that's not all. You're telling me you actually change the altimeter to the wrong setting? They've also come up with ways to silence the nuisance alarms. One way is to simply reset the altimeter. That fools the system into thinking the plane is flying at a higher altitude. Turn on your landing lights. Lights on. It's a temporary fix. As the crew of the presidential jet continues to descend, the alarm sounds again just 20 seconds later. Start playback. It seems incredible that such an elite crew flying such high-ranking passengers would commit a breach of procedures. 100 meters. Even if they did, it doesn't explain why the navigator was calling out the wrong altitude during the descent. 90 meters. Stop, play back. He was using his radio altimeter. Most large jets are equipped with two types of altimeter. 40. Since the barometric altimeter has been reset, 30. The navigator could only have been using the second one. 20. His radio altimeter. It uses radio waves to measure the distance between the plane and the ground below. But the terrain near Smolensk Air Base is uneven. Planes have to fly over a valley to reach it. Look what happens here. When the radio altimeter reads 100 meters, the Air Force jet was not 100 meters above the airport. It was 100 meters from the bottom of the valley. In the dense fog, the pilots couldn't see the ground. Once they cleared the valley, they were just a few meters from the treetops. The radio altimeter was giving them misleading information. Using the radio altimeter at this early stage of approach is a serious mistake. It doomed everyone on board. Investigators have discovered why the plane crashed into the forest. But there is another question to consider. Why would he even try an approach in such foggy weather? Temperature plus two, pressure 745. We do not have landing conditions. The pilots were warned that conditions were not suitable for landing, yet they persisted and descended towards Smolensk Airport. <laughs> After getting the information about the fog and visibility, the decision to fly to the alternate airport should have been made immediately. A closer look at Captain Protasiuk's history may help explain that decision. This was not the first time he'd flown with the president of Poland. Everyone in Poland knew what happened a few years ago when the captain served as the co-pilot during the Azerbaijan flight. In August of 2008, the president wanted to fly into a war zone. Protasiuk was the first officer on the flight. I'll inform ATC of your decision. Negative, we will not be landing in Tbilisi. 
the captain refused to fly to an unsafe airport. His captain was ordered to land in Georgia, but he did not follow this order. The captain of that flight paid a high price for being cautious. This seriously affected the pilot's career. He was never chosen to fly for the president again. There was no direct pressure from the president, but we all know, and certainly the pilots remembered, what happened when the pilot refused to land in Tbilisi. He probably didn't want to lose his job. Mr. Director, the fog has rolled in. We all make an attempt, but it probably won't work. No one wants to disappoint a president. Though Protasiuk knew landing was risky, he may have wanted to show his passengers that he was willing to try. To be clear, this person did not give any instructions. But just his presence in the cockpit interrupted the workflow, the decision-making and communication among the crew. Polish Air Force 101. We have fog. Visibility is 400 meters. Understood. Polish Air Force 101. Having to communicate with the tower in Russian only made things more stressful. 400 meters. All the pressure may have led the captain to make a fatal mistake. Continuing our approach. If we're unsuccessful, we'll go around on autopilot. He plans to engage the autopilot's go-around function to climb away from the airport if he doesn't like what he sees. Pushing the go-around button should quickly increase power to the engines, enabling the plane to climb. But that can't work at this airport. The key error was the assumption that it would be possible to climb in autopilot mode. For the go-around function to work, the autopilot must be locked onto a specific beacon at the end of the runway. It's called an ILS beacon but Smolensk Air Base doesn't have one. We are leaving for a go-around. Protasiuk waited five seconds for the plane to climb out on its own before realizing he'd made an error. 90 meters. By the time he realizes his mistake, it is too late. There's no dispute. The crew mishandled the approach, but Polish investigators don't think they are the only ones at fault. Approaching outer marker, on course and on glide slope. The air traffic controllers were responsible for guiding the plane to a safe landing. They knew visibility was extremely poor, so why did they go along with Protasiuk's plan to make a trial descent? Polish 101 acknowledge. Polish Air Force, we have fog. Visibility is 400 meters. Polish investigators need to know more about how Russian air traffic control may have contributed to the tragedy. There's no doubt that the air traffic controller has a vital role, especially when the clouds and fog are so bad that you can't see the ground. The temperature and pressure, please. Temperature is plus two, pressure is seven, four, five. We do not have landing conditions. The investigators are surprised to discover that even though the airbase knew it would be handling a very important flight that day... Are you at 500 meters? The controllers seem unprepared to receive it. Interviews with the Russian air traffic controllers reveal that they had difficulty tracking the plane on its descent. We asked him to report his altitude. The Smolensk airport is a very poorly equipped airport. Polish Air Force, are you at 500 meters? We are at 500 meters. The controllers had to rely on the captain to report his altitude. Polish investigators speculate that the equipment in Smolensk wasn't providing a clear image of the plane's location. The controller could not be sure if the plane was on course. On course and on glide slope. 
obsługa lotniska potwierdza. The controller confirmed that the plane was on the flight path. W momencie, kiedy the moment it went below the flight path, the risk of disaster rose dramatically. The controller confirmed the plane was on the correct approach path, when in fact it was dangerously low. There's no doubt that the airport was not ready. The thickening fog only increased the level of tension and confusion in the control tower. I just don't think we should bring him in. It makes no sense right now. Before the president's plane reached the airport, the controllers knew it would be almost impossible to land. But they didn't have the authority to turn the jet away. We have to find an alternate for the pole. We just don't have the weather. They didn't want the plane to land. They tried to convince their superiors that this airplane should be redirected to another airport before they even started the landing procedure. The decision whether or not the president of Poland should fly to Russia and where he should land is not made in Smolensk. It is not made by the head of flight operations or by the air traffic controllers. But the fact is that the conditions did not permit any kind of plane to land, especially a plane full of VIPs. The controller was waiting for Captain Protasiuk to make the decision not to land. We do not have landing conditions. Continuing our approach. If we're unsuccessful, we'll go around on autopilot. It's his call. Let them continue on their own. I think that the same indirect pressure that was experienced by the captain of the TU-154 aircraft was shared by the ATC controllers because of the nature of this flight. It all happened because of outside forces, the crew and the group of flight operators. They became hostages of the situation. Although both reports criticize the actions of the pilots, the Polish report goes further, criticizing the Smolensk airport for its poor performance. Approaching outer marker, on course and on glide slope. I stąd potwierdzani przez stronę rosyjską załodze. The fact they confirmed that the flight path was correct when it wasn't may have been because their equipment was faulty. Wynikiem niesprawności technicznej tejże aparatury. The Russians were much more evasive than the Poles. Poles frankly took on their responsibility the way the Russians did not take up theirs. In the wake of the disaster, the special regiment assigned to transport Polish officials is disbanded. A little more than a year after the accident, Poland's interior minister Jerzy Miller presents his findings to the world. The Russians dispute his report's conclusions about Smolensk air traffic control. Despite two reports to the contrary, deep suspicions persist, including the belief that the president was assassinated. You have people who are desperately trying to understand what happened, and they're given information they're not qualified to assess. I mean, I, I'm not qualified to assess information of the Russian or of the Polish commission or of the counter experts. I'm not an expert. So finally, I have to decide whose experts do I trust. In the end, two historic adversaries managed to put aside their differences and work together for a common goal. The goal is simple. Every accident must teach us a lesson. How to train the crew to make safety their highest priority when making decisions. Unfortunately, learning that lesson has come at a very high cost. Bardzo dużo nasz ta nauka kosztowała. FedEx Flight 705. Positive rate. Gear up, please. A routine trip from Memphis, Tennessee to San Jose, California. Little do the crew know they will soon have to defend themselves against a determined attack intended to kill them all. 
Flight 705 will never reach its destination. We've had an attempt to take over. Investigators will uncover a meticulous plan and a desperate motive. It's April 1994. A FedEx cargo plane is on its way to California. No, it's a no. perfect day for flying. Altimeters? Nines and twos here. But behind the cockpit, in the galley area, a disaster is about to unfold. The pilots of FedEx Flight 705 are seconds away from an unprecedented situation. Oh, God almighty. <laughs> Center, center emergency. He's had an attempted takeover. We need an ambulance, and uh, we need armed intervention. Let me out, please. April the 7th, 1994. Worldwide headquarters of Federal Express in Memphis, Tennessee. Servicing 171 countries, the company delivers over 2 million packages per day and works to a tight schedule. Flying conditions are perfect at the Memphis airport. FedEx Flight 705 to San Jose, California is preparing to depart with a three-man crew. Has the afternoon flight to San Jose got any jump seaters on it? None at all. 42-year-old Auburn Calloway is a flight engineer. He hopes to hitch a ride on flight 705 for pressing personal reasons. Thanks. Employees have the privilege of free rides. They're known as jump seaters. 39-year-old flight engineer Andy Peterson is the first of the flight crew to arrive on the plane. Andy Peterson, Auburn Calloway. He's surprised to find Auburn Calloway on board. My first thought was, well, scheduling has gotten, uh, it's also called someone else out for the flight, and now we've got two engineers. So I said hey to him and then asked him if he was uh, going to be riding out to San Jose with us, and he said he was, that he was going to ride the jump seat out. Peterson, a five-year flyer with FedEx, finds something unusual during his pre-flight check. The breaker switch of the cockpit voice recorder, or CVR, is in the off position. Puzzled, Peterson resets it. The CVR records all in-flight voice communications. It's a crucial tool for investigating air disasters. No large commercial airliner is allowed to fly without one. The cockpit voice circuit breaker, it had popped out which meaning the power's off to the cockpit voice recorder. Uh, so I'd never seen that before, and I thought, well, that's kind of weird. 49-year-old pilot David Sanders and 42-year-old co-pilot James Tucker are next to board and prepare for departure. You mind if I hop around with you guys California? No, not at all. I don't see any problems today. Everything looks good. You, uh, you play the guitar? I play at it. He was very cool, uh, calm, collected, uh, nothing indicating anything was amiss. Actually noticing there was a guitar case off to the right in front of the 9G net. Yeah, but I couldn't wait to get in the cockpit and start going through cockpit checks because we had a lot to do. But something was amiss. They didn't know it, but Callaway had originally been scheduled to be the flight engineer on this flight. However, he and his crew had exceeded their flying hours by just one minute the previous day, so they'd been replaced but Callaway was determined to make Flight 705 no matter what. I think she'll fly. Oh, we got some bolts around? Yeah. Uh, when I came back out on the airplane and went back up to the cockpit, I noticed that that circuit breaker had popped out again. So I reset it and decided that I would see if it would stay in uh, instead of calling maintenance at that time, that I'd just wait and see if it, if it popped back out, that I would call maintenance because that is a no-go item. 
If the CVR is turned off, there will be no audio record of the events aboard Flight 705. You want to fly this leg of the trip, or do you prefer the return trip? You never know when you're going to get another chance. <laughs> I met Jim Tucker that afternoon. Jim had been with the company for 10 years. In fact, he was an instructor in the DC-10. Andy Peterson and I had had a trip together. In fact, we flew to Paris one time. The crew is flying together for the first time. Both Tucker and Sanders are ex-Navy. Sanders has been with FedEx for 20 years. James Tucker, who has a wife and three children at home, has been with the company for 10 years. None of the crew know Callaway or his reasons for being on this flight. Express 705, heavy runway 27, clear for takeoff. Express 705, cleared for takeoff. Lights if you want them. <laughs> I mean, clocks if you want them. Lights are coming on. We'll get the vertical speed wheel here in a minute. That's the checklist, though. All right, before takeoff is complete. Your airplane. Set standard power, please, before they change their mind. Power is set. Flight 705 is airborne and westward bound. The weather to California is clear, and if all goes as planned, they'll be back home within 10 hours. But back in the cargo area, Auburn Calloway is launching a different plan, a plan he's been shaping and reshaping for several days. Like the brilliant chess player he is, Calloway has thought out all his moves. Being bounced from the crew of Flight 705 today was an unexpected glitch, but nothing he can't cope with. At his home that morning, Callaway already had to make a small adjustment to his plans. The flight bag he'd planned to take with him on his journey is in for repairs, so instead he packs a guitar case as a company employee, he's unlikely to be searched, and a guitar case seems innocent enough. Here you have a man who made some accomplishments that no other African American had ever made. Callaway graduated from Stanford University in 1974. He became a top Navy flyer, then a commercial pilot, but his five years at FedEx have been as a flight engineer. He was highly intelligent, a driven person uh, to accomplish goals, and uh, had before him a, an opportunity of a, a tremendously positive uh, career. He was married and had uh, children and family, and it just seemed as though um, he was almost uh, part of the uh, true American dream, just about, the American family. Before leaving for the airport, Calloway put some important documents on his bed. Among them, his last will and testament. FedEx Flight 705 is several minutes outside Memphis, still climbing and passing through 5,800 meters. Jim Tucker is hand-flying the airplane using control wheel steering mode and enjoying the clear afternoon skies. A couple of meters away sits Auburn Calloway. Behind him lie frustrated expectations of a brilliant career and a marriage that ended in tears. Two minutes, nines and twos here. After takeoff is complete. Calloway has a terrifying plan. His guitar case is packed with several hammers and a spear gun. Out of sight of the crew, he gets his weapons ready. To be successful, Callaway will have to act quickly. Speed and strength will be critical. Callaway is a former Navy pilot and a martial arts expert, so speed and strength come as part of the package. 
The uh, original plan was to uh, take out his original crew, which would have only been two individuals. One was a female, much smaller than the crew that he wound up facing on Flight 705. No, I live in Fisherville. Fisherville, great spot. I had the cockpit door locked open, and I noticed that Callaway was walking up into the cockpit. I just caught him out of the corner of my eye and basically saw his, uh, you know, his arm coming up, and I thought, well, he's just coming up to sit and talk with us for a while. <laughs> excruciating pain, blinding pain. So much, in fact, that uh, I never lost consciousness, but I lost useful consciousness for at least 45 seconds. A blow to the head will rattle the brain. It will shake it enough that it, the electrical connections momentarily are not working. And it can be anywhere from a complete, irretrievable loss of consciousness to simply a stun uh, uh, or to what he describes as as a period of time where he was somewhat aware of what was going on, but, but could not respond to it. I was slumped back like this, and he looked, I remember, right in my eyes as he passed over. It was almost probably like, well, the lights are on, but there's nobody home here. This guy is out of action, so I'll move on to the next person. The crew is in shock and confused. What I saw was simply a face in his eyes and an object coming down at me. Ah! I didn't discern any emotion or hate or anger. I just saw a threat, and I didn't really know what the threat was, because it's so shocking. And for a crew member who is a pilot in uniform to attack another pilot is unheard of in the airline industry. Although terribly injured, Peterson and Tucker are still alive. Oh. Get him! Callaway hurriedly retreats out of the cockpit. Unaware of each other's injuries, the crew starts to mobilize. Callaway has a backup plan. The spear gun stashed outside the cockpit is a deadly weapon. Sit down! Sit down! Get back to your seats! This is a real gun, and I'll kill you! There was a loud ringing in my ear, and I was a little unbalanced. But I saw this spear gun and I thought, well, the only thing I can do is try to grab it. So I grabbed the spear. It sticks out of the spear gun about, I don't know, four inches or so. So I grabbed it right behind the barbs and tried to hang on to it real tight. Tucker does something that Callaway is not expecting. He pulls back the yoke and puts the plane into a sudden 15 degree climb. It throws the struggling men out of the cockpit into the galley behind. I had already figured out that what I had in my hands is probably one of the best weapons available, and that was the aircraft itself. Tucker has not been just a Navy pilot, but a combat instructor flying A-4s. His fighter pilot experience would prove invaluable in the next few minutes. I was looking at this whole situation as if it was an air combat maneuvering situation. Get him! We're taught in the Navy uh, and, and, and the fighter community is that you know the first thing you want to do is, is engage the bogey and engage the bad guy. You make him predictable by engaging him, uh, and, and, and you use his predictability then uh, against him, and then you kill the bogey. Get him! Get him! Get him! But the co-pilot doesn't stop there. Tucker immediately rolls the massive aircraft to the left in an acrobatic maneuver to try and disarm Callaway. Kill you! The men roll along the smoke curtain to the left side of the plane. I knew that I had to do something very abrupt, uh, very, very rough, and something that he would not be expecting. Get him. Tucker has no idea whether rolling the plane is helping Sanders and Peterson as they try to restrain Callaway. The fight continues with the men pinned to the left side of the plane. The crew members are rapidly losing blood and strength. Tucker continues to execute the roll, all the while trying to maintain a visual reference outside the captain's window. Get him, get him, Andy, I got the airplane. 
as so you roll the airplane over on its back and pull through completely in the vertical. But at this particular point, uh, you know, if, if I'd rolled the airplane over on its back, I wouldn't really be able to see what I was doing. This is not a bubble canopy that you have over the top. You're actually looking out. It's got expansive windows, but nonetheless, you roll this airplane over on its back, uh, you can't really see that much of what you're doing. So I rolled it to about 140 degrees where I could still see out over the side as the airplane's nose was starting to come through. Tucker rolls the quarter million kilogram DC-10 to 140 degrees, almost on its back. Commercial aircraft are never meant to roll more than 60 degrees. The men continue their fight on the ceiling of the aircraft. Callaway wrenches the hammer in his hand free and hits Sanders in the head. Tucker decides to pull back on the yoke and put the plane into a steep dive, a risky but cunning move. The g-force of the dive pushes the men back along the ceiling to the smoke curtain. The plane is traveling at a very dangerous speed. Tucker is making demands of the aircraft for which it was not designed. DC-10s are never meant to be flown past 695 kilometers per hour. Tucker is over 800 kilometers per hour. No DC-10 in history has been flown so fast and survived. The airspeed indicator was maxed. It was all the way to what we call the barber pole. Couldn't go any faster, but you could tell that you were going very, uh, quite a bit faster because of things you don't normally hear in a jet that size. And one is the incredible amounts of uh, sound of wind coming across the cockpit. The plane approaches supersonic speed. With the increased airspeed, the airflow over the stabilizer becomes disrupted. The elevators begin to flutter back and forth. If the flutter becomes more pronounced, they may become inoperable, and Tucker will no longer have the means to pull the plane out of the dive. If I didn't pull out soon, the airplane was probably going to come apart, because I was getting into a, uh, a phenomenon known as mock tuck, where the airplane is pitching over because the airspeed is increasing so much, the, uh, the, uh, the, the wind flow over the, over the, uh, the surfaces of the wings is, is doing things that it's not even designed to do. The injury to the left side of Tucker's brain is beginning to paralyze functions on the right side of his body. Tucker notices something alarming. The plane is traveling at this incredible speed because the throttle levers have been left in their automatic climb setting from takeoff. The DC-10 is now in a vertical dive with the engines at nearly full power. Tucker must release his only usable hand from the yoke to pull back on the throttles. With power reduced to idle, the DC-10 is still not out of danger. Despite Tucker's maneuvers, Callaway is gaining the upper hand. Callaway hit me with the third blow, which was in the top of my head, nearly rendered me unconscious. I began to gray out. At that very same time, it occurred to me we might lose this thing. As Tucker starts to pull the plane carefully out of the dive, the elevator flutter increases. Balance panels, counterweights that help the pilots manipulate the elevator, break free and begin to wrinkle the skin of the stabilizer. Tucker fears that if he pulls back too hard during the dive, all the surfaces on the tail section would be in danger of coming off. Sanders' strength is nearly spent, and Peterson's head is bleeding profusely from his ruptured temporal artery. Somehow, they manage to pin their attacker down. The G-forces begin to be reduced as he began to level off from pulling out of the dive. I saw the hammer in Calloway's hand. I then reached for the hammer with both my hands and pulled the hammer out of his hand. Sanders believes this is a turning point. The plane is safe for the moment. About a minute after the attack begins, Tucker finally has a chance to radio Memphis. Centers, center emergency.
Air traffic controller Kent Fleshman and his trainee receive Tucker's emergency request. Aircraft with emergency, say again. Sir. Aircraft with emergency, say again. Listen to me. It's Express 705. I've been wounded. We've had an attempt to take over and aboard the airplane. Give me a vector, please. Back to Memphis at this time. Hurry. Express 705, fly heading 09 or 5, direct Memphis. 095. Direct to Memphis. Get me an ambulance and alert the airport facility. Hey, Memphis, you still with me? Affirmative 705, descend and maintain 10,000. Fleshman takes action in case the hijacker has a gun. If he can get the plane below 3,000 meters, a bullet hole in the fuselage will not cause explosive decompression. Tucker hears the fight increase in the galley. Again, he uses his only weapon, the aircraft. The maneuver throws the men onto the side of the plane. Let go of the spear. Look, just keep talking to me, OK? Express 705, affirmative. If you need an ambulance, stand by and we'll get that for you. Yeah, we need an ambulance and... Uh... We need armed intervention as well. Make sure and notify the SWAT team he's asking for armed intervention. Fleshman recognizes the term armed intervention as the most serious request from a pilot. It means they want armed officials to storm the plane upon landing. Memphis' approach has to be alerted. We have an emergency, Express 705. He's had an attempted at takeover on the aircraft. He's had an attempted at takeover? OK. Radar contact, put him on 119.1. Paul Candelino, a 44-year-old veteran controller, now spots Flight 705 on his radar screen. But something's wrong. The plane is heading away from the airport. It looks like the hijacker has seized the plane. The crew of FedEx Flight 705 has been attacked by a co-worker and have declared an emergency. Air traffic control watches helplessly as they fly away from the airport while the fight for control of the plane continues. Co-pilot James Tucker is pushing the DC-10, his best weapon, to its limits. He now throws the wheel round, flipping the massive plane in the opposite direction. Tucker, drawing on his military experience, reverses the role, keeping his maneuvers unpredictable. Here I am, all alone in the cockpit. The fight is still going on in the back. I don't know who's winning, I don't know who's losing. And that was about the only time I really had time uh, to be frightened, and it was a very horrifying situation at that point, uh, thinking that quite possibly uh, Auburn was winning. Three and a half minutes after the attack, Though pinned and injured, Auburn Calloway will not relinquish the spear. The anger was coming in then, and so when I hit him, it was with the intent to disable him and eliminate his ability to fight. Not kill, but to injure him sufficiently that he could fight no more. So when I swung the hammer, it was with all the strength that I had. Sanders and Peterson momentarily subdue Callaway. We're going on it, pilot. They get back here. All right, Jim, the captain's yeah. yelling at Tucker to come and help, but he's the one flying the plane. Express 705. I've contact Memphis approach on 119.1. They are aware of your emergency. Jim. Quick, Jim. Request a single frequency approach. A single frequency approach. Roger, we'll pass that along. 119.1. Put it on autopilot. Come on, Jim. Come hey, get back here. But you have to understand that that's probably the, the strangest request that I've ever had you know, come my way because here I am, uh, the only one up front in the cockpit now, for, and for me to go ahead and get up and go to the back means I've got to, uh, first of all, stand up, which I didn't know until the particular time I tried to stand up. It was very, very difficult to do so. Jim Tucker, with a fractured skull and only one side of his body functioning, puts the plane on autopilot and struggles out of his seat to help. Hey, wait a minute, I'm coming. But the plane's gyros haven't stabilized sufficiently for the autopilot to take over. Okay. Now, no one's flying the plane. 705 Heavy, how do you hear? 
Paul Candelino tries to establish radio contact with Flight 705, but there's no response. Their radar screens show the aircraft turn to the north, then the west, finally southwest, heading away from the airport. There's only an eerie silence. Anything could be happening on board the plane. As I stepped into the forward cargo area, uh, I was absolutely amazed at what I was seeing. All three of the individuals are completely covered with blood. Auburn Callaway on his back. There are papers everywhere in the back. You can see where the jump seats, uh, which is just a normal uh, commercial airline seat, has had the covers torn off. There's bloody footprints on the top of the ceiling. There are coats that have come out of closets. Um, it, it, it's total carnage in the back. Sanders has disarmed Callaway and handed the spear to Tucker. You move, I'll kill you. You keep him contained, I'm going to get the airplane. Go get the airplane. They decide that Sanders, the captain, yeah. should fly the plane back to Memphis. You take this. Tucker wants the weapons as far away from Callaway as possible and asks Sanders to take them with him to the cockpit. In an emergency situation, it's expected that the captain of the airplane will fly the airplane. I was in somewhat of a daze because of the fight. I wasn't sure of the direction of the airplane. I wasn't sure of the condition of the airplane, but it appeared to be flying OK. I was bleeding excessively from, uh, from the top of my head. It couldn't see out of my left eye. I thought the fight was over. I mean, I had hit Callaway four times in the head with a 20 ounce framing hammer as hard as I could swing it. He had stopped fighting and he was bleeding, and he looked like he was severely injured. Tucker can't tell anymore whether his hand is gripping the spear. The blows to his head have caused a blood clot on his brain and have damaged his sense of touch. Let me up! Let me up! I won't fight anymore! Please, I can't breathe! Though several gashes have been opened in his skull, Auburn Calloway cannot be trusted. Both pilots know their strength is quickly running out. Sanders, safely back in the driver's seat, must get the plane on the ground and fast. Memphis, can you hear me? Is this Express 705 Heavy? 705 Heavy, yes. Express 705 Heavy, Memphis. Roger, I do hear you. You can proceed direct to Memphis if able. Expect runway niner. The altimeter is 30.29. You understand we're declaring an emergency. We need security to meet the airplane. We'll stop on the runway if we can. Captain Sanders, without his glasses and with blood dripping into his eyes, thinks that the plane is on a course back to the airport. But it's still heading southwest, away from Memphis at over 550 kilometers per hour. Roger. Express 705 Heavy, is the situation under control? Or is it still in progress? We appear to have it under control. Candelino wants to warn the pilot, but he's afraid the crew may still be under attack and trying to mislead the hijackers by flying in the wrong direction. Express 705 Heavy, are you able to turn toward the airport? Uh, yeah, give me a vector. 100 zero, zero, Vector Memphis. Sanders takes the plane off autopilot and sets a course back to the airport. We're turning to the airport now. For now, aboard the DC-10, the situation seems under control, but a potential disaster is only moments away. At the Memphis airport, emergency personnel begin to move into position. We need security to meet the airplane. We'll stop on the runway if we can. A FedEx cargo plane is about to land after a would-be hijacker tried to seize control. All members of the crew are badly injured. Paramedic David Teague is one of the first to get the call. They came over the uh, loudspeaker system from the uh, air traffic control center, and uh, I was new to the area, uh, so I wasn't able to understand them real well, but I got the words hijacking and some other stuff and, and was advised that there had been a hijacking on, a, on an airplane, and then dispatched us out to the runway where the plane was going to be landed. The airplane is heading for the safety of Memphis Airport, but that in itself presents another scary possibility. 
The aircraft is more than 16,000 kilos over the recommended landing weight, with more than 38,000 kilos of fuel still in its tanks. In most emergency landing situations, there's time and opportunity to dump any excess fuel. But Sanders knows the switches and levers are too far away to access safely. You'd have to get up and go back to the engineer's panel where the uh, fuel dumping switches are and set up the engineer's fuel panel to dump fuel. So it's virtually impossible for, say, the captain uh, to dump fuel while he's attempting to fly the airplane. In the galley, Auburn Calloway still hasn't given up the fight. Calloway drags himself towards the jump seats with Peterson and Tucker on top of him. He hopes to gain enough leverage to get back on his feet, where he'll have an advantage. He was using his thumbs to go ahead and try and push my eyes out, doing everything he possibly could to break Andy and I down as a team. You know, we could handle them together, but we certainly couldn't handle it one-on-one. -on -one. This is certainly a, a, a fight against the clock. Uh, Auburn's getting stronger. Uh, I know we're getting weaker. I knew if he ever got back in the cockpit, we were history. I just knew we had to keep him. Somehow, we had to keep him from getting back in that cockpit. Approaching 7,000 feet, the fight in the back started again. And it was as violent and as loud as when I was in the back in the midst of the fight. It became so violent and loud that approaching 7,000 feet, I decided that I was going to level the airplane, turn on the autopilot, go to the back of the airplane, and kill Callaway. It was so severe, I thought that had to be done. The DC-10 is less than 40 kilometers from Memphis airport. Is he under control? I don't know. The sound of the struggle worries Sanders. He decides this has to end. I released the seatbelt, climbed out of my seat, headed to the back of the airplane, and Jim Tucker said to me, David, I think we have him under control now. I said, are you sure? Yeah, he is. He said, I think we have him under control. I went back to the seat, climbed into the left seat of the airplane, continued to descent on down toward the airport. Express 705, have you verified the situation is still under control? Uh, yeah, we're, uh, it's uh, sort of under control. The wind is uh, 03015, clear to land runway niner. <laughs> Clear to land. Now Sanders faces yet another possible disaster. The delay caused by getting out of his seat means he's way over the normal approach speed, too high and too fast. He'll not be able to slow the overweight plane quickly enough to land on runway Niner. I'm coming around to three six left. Runway three six left is longer at 2,800 meters but it's perpendicular to his flight path. To land there, he needs to make a series of turns, reasonable maneuvers for a fighter jet or a crop duster, but for an overloaded DC-10 with an injured pilot, nearly impossible. First, he must turn 90 degrees to the right, fly parallel to the runway, and then execute a tight 180 degree turn. Okay, Express 705 Heavy, runway 36 left, cleared to land, cleared visual approach, 36 left, wind is uh, 050 at 8. Bank angle. Sanders must ignore the computer warnings and push the plane beyond normal operating limits. The plane is nearly on its side. All of a sudden, he just turned it up on his wingtip, looked like a fighter jet, and uh, put it in a real tight turn and then disappeared down behind the terminal when he got down low enough, we couldn't see him. And uh, uh, at first, well, I thought he might have crashed because there was some construction going on on the, run, on the airport at that time, and there was some smoke coming up south of the terminal, kind of where we were going. A hammer is lying in the galley. The men struggle to reach it. This could be Callaway's last chance to gain control. Sanders has turned 90 degrees to the south, flying the downwind leg parallel to runway 36 left. The airplane was probably at about 300 feet above the ground at that time. The throttles are at idle. They've been at idle since I left 7,000 feet. That's an extremely unusual 
engine power setting to land a big airplane. You always land, make the approach with power on, a lot of power on. In this case, it was at idle because I wanted the airplane to slow down so that we would not exceed the limits of the landing gear and the flaps so that we would touch down at or below 195 knots. With flaps extended and landing gear down, Sanders is still coming in too fast, and he's being bombarded by computerized auto-warning alarms. The runway is 2,800 meters long. A normal DC-10 needs only 1,900 meters to stop. But Flight 705 is too heavy. Even this runway may not be long enough. Peterson manages for the first time in the fight to get hold of a hammer, but is extremely weak due to blood loss. You gotta hit him, Andy! You gotta hit him! I was almost like pleading with him, and I told him, I said, Andy, you know, you gotta hit him. You know, he's he's about ready to, you know, to take us down. And I guess I gave him kind of a blank stare of, you know, what are you talking about? And he looked at me real stern like a father would look at his son, saying, you've got to do this. And he said, Hit him. The DC-10 is only meters above the runway, traveling at 382 kilometers per hour. Sanders can only hope he won't explode the tires or crash beyond the runway. Luckily, all 10 tires withstand the landing impact. Captain David Sanders has landed the plane with only 300 meters of runway to spare. The crew of Flight 705 is safely on the ground, but not out of danger. Blow the door. The chute is covered with kind of a talcum powder, so it won't stick when it needs to be deployed, And but it made it slick trying to go up. The police and firemen tried to climb up the slide. One fireman made it almost all the way to the top, and I leaned out the door of the airplane and pulled him on board. Who's the bad guy? That's the attacker. There was blood all over the floor, all over the ceiling. Uh, the seats in the in the little area uh, were, were just covered with blood. You got any handcuffs? Mm. If not, you better get some, because that son of a bitch is still dangerous. I need handcuffs. Can you throw me some handcuffs? Teague is thrown a pair of handcuffs. <laughs> Stand here, in the middle of the chain. Ouch! Get your foot off! You're hurting me! Ow! Sanders holds Callaway down as Teague examines Peterson, who barely has a pulse and is the first crew member to leave the plane. Sanders is the last member of the crew on board. Standing in the door of the airplane, I had a sense of euphoria I've never experienced before since. It was the sense of we had been there, and, uh, and we came back, and we won. Due to the strength and courage of its crew, a FedEx DC-10 has safely landed back home. The three men have weathered the attack of a co-worker, but they're badly injured. Co-pilot Jim Tucker has bone chips driven into his brain. Flight engineer Andy Peterson's life is in danger from massive blood loss. Both are in critical condition. The wounded men are rushed to the regional medical center at Memphis. The pilot, Dave Sanders, shares an ambulance with Tucker. It's only during this ride that he realizes the extent and severity of his co-pilot's injuries. Tucker is taken to emergency by stretcher. Sanders is helped, but can walk.
Restrained and under guard, Calloway is also taken to the same emergency facility. But the important question still remains, why did Auburn Calloway attack the crew of Flight 705? The full story is beginning to unfold. Divorced in 1990, Auburn Calloway still tries to support his ex-wife and their two children, and wants to secure their financial future. He was very interested in the welfare of his children, very interested that they not live the kind of childhood he had lived. The evidence for a suicidal mission against FedEx grows as investigators search the aircraft and find a letter to Calloway's estranged wife. Dear Pat, I want you and the kids to know that I lived for you. I thought of your welfare every day. Though, for example, how can I guarantee having enough money for Keela and Bernie Stanford education? He was obsessed with his financial well-being. He was interested in his children. Um, I tend to believe he's interested in his marriage. And I know his marriage was coming apart, or had come apart, basically, at the time of this incident. Um, but I suspect he was also a difficult man to be married to. By April the 7th, 1994, Calloway may be thinking his career is over. Life had been one disappointment after another. The failed marriage, the kids he can't afford to send to university, the brilliant pilot who ends up as an engineer on a cargo plane. And now even that may be about to go. The following day, he's supposed to report to a FedEx hearing about falsified information he'd given the company. During our investigation, it appeared that he had overestimated the number of hours of flight experience that he had uh, and uh, that the uh, company was taking a look at this. Callaway may be afraid he'll be fired. At just 42, his professional life could be finished. He comes up with a solution. The goal is to leave my children well off. The goal is to escape, I guess, the pain of this life. Uh, I can't continue to participate in this life and still leave them well off because I'm fixing to lose my career. And I won't have the ability to provide for them like I'd like to. But my life has value if it's given in an accident. Callaway cashes in all the funds he can lay his hands on and sends a total of $54,000 to his ex-wife but his life insurance is worth about two and a half million dollars if he dies in a work-related accident. I would much rather go on a date, time, place, and a method of my own choosing. I resolved some time ago that the next time my security and future is threatened or seriously jeopardized, it's time, my time to go. Perhaps he believes his family would receive the maximum insurance payout if he crashed the plane in an apparent accident. If this was Calloway's idea, he was planning it perfectly. He was armed with unusual weapons for hijacking, hammers and a spear gun. After injuring the crew, he could take control of the plane a bomb or gun could leave traces at the scene of a crash, but if investigators found a spear gun or hammers, it would be very difficult to tie them to an attack on the crew. I believe it would have been impossible to tell the difference in the type of injuries that a hammer would have made uh, with the type of injuries that you might sustain in a, in a large crash. Uh, Auburn had spent the week leading up to this uh, incident preparing to, uh, to die and basically get his affairs in order. Callaway even goes to a lawyer to change his will before boarding the FedEx flight. He left his will and testament on his bed so that uh, it would be easily found. For any crash to look like an accident, there is a key obstacle the plane's cockpit voice recorder. Switching off the CVR's power would disable any recording. I think she'll fly. As long as all the nuts and bolts are there. Yeah. If Peterson, in his pre-flight inspection, discovers the thrown switch, it would be a setback. But Callaway would know he simply has to fly the airplane for half an hour. That's the length of the tape's recording time. After 30 minutes, any incriminating recording would be gone forever. 
Now, I think he was going to do something very, very horrible with it. Something along the lines of what we've seen on 9-11. Had Calloway been able to seize control of the plane, he could have crashed the DC-10 with over 38,000 kilos of fuel aboard into any site, including the FedEx headquarters, the hub, crippling his employer and killing a large number of workers on the ground. It would have been the ultimate revenge for perceived injustices by the company. The company may never have figured out exactly why that airplane crashed back into the hub. Well, after 9-11, there were a lot of uh, improvements to our security program, both in the United States and worldwide. Uh, our cockpit crew members are the most highly checked and monitored group of people in the world. I only know of this one incident uh, in my 46 years of aviation experience where a crew member was involved in something like this. The flight of FedEx 705 took about 30 minutes, but the impact it had will last for years. He was convicted of attempt aircraft piracy, an offense that carried a minimum of uh, 20 years confinement and up to life in prison. Although Auburn Calloway pleaded temporary insanity at his trial, the jury didn't believe him and found him guilty. On August the 11th, 1995, he was sentenced to life imprisonment in a federal penitentiary. He has no chance of parole. The pilots on Flight 705, they are the real heroes. It is amazing that they were able to do what they did, given the injuries that were inflicted upon them. When someone's struck with a hammer on the skull, there can be linear uh, radiating uh, cracks that go out on the skull. And then if it's hard enough, there may well be uh, indriven bone right at the site where the hammer head hits the skull and drives it into the skull. This is a replica of my skull cap. Um, it's, uh, it was uh, put together by, by use of a, a CAT scan protocol uh, to give the, uh, the proper uh, you know, shape of my skull and also the, the shape of the defect that we're dealing with here. This is the area that I was hit on the left parietal. For a year and a half, I was actually walking around in this configuration. It took two and a half years to recover completely because I had to learn how to walk, talk, and chew gum all over again. I had three major operations. Uh, I operated on him uh, twice more after his initial uh, injury and then followed him through his rehabilitation. They can fashion a piece of material to fit the exact size of the defect, uh, the shape of the skull, and of course the thickness of the skull as well. It's a blown acrylic called an HTR or hard tissue replacement. He had difficulty with speech, difficulty with, with sensation and motor strength on the right side. And he uh, came back to where he can now uh, probably, if he wanted to, break my fingers with a handshake. On May the 26th, 1994, the crew of FedEx Flight 705 was awarded the Airline Pilots Association Gold Medal Award for Heroism, the highest award a civilian pilot can receive. However, because of the legacy of their injuries, none of the crew has been certified as medically fit to fly commercially. I always thought, I'm gonna fight, I'm gonna, I'm gonna overcome this thing. Except that that's when they found out that I had a uh, slight seizure disorder. I'm seizure free, but it's because I had to take medication. And the only way for me to, to be able to fly uh, uh, without somebody with me is to be off of medication. At this particular point, it's been, it's been uh, ascertained that I'll never be able to do that. I'll be on medication for the rest of my life. Uh, I miss the flying. Every time I see an airplane go over, I, you know, I wonder where it's going. So I miss that part of it. Uh, but I really cherish the fact that you know, I'm still alive and able to be with my family. Uh, the bond of pilots and what you do together in the airplane, outside the airplane, all that, I miss that. I miss it very much.